Change has always been a powerful force of nature. National parks and the stories they represent help us understand and appreciate how interconnected the environment really is and illustrate to us how even just a small change can have profound effects on the delicate balance of nature. Today we hear more and more about the effects of climate change. Scientists tell us there is little doubt that human activities are having a major impact on the atmosphere and ecosystems of our planet. Glaciers and snowpacks are melting, stream temperatures are going up, coastal erosion is increasing, and changes in weather patterns are leading to drought and heat waves both locally and regionally. The strength and pace of these changes are unprecedented in human history. Many of them have consequences that will affect the resources and influence the experience for which the national parks were established. No matter what caused these changes, we must do what we can to manage these impacts and adapt to the new circumstances that they bring. Perhaps the same wisdom that has preserved the heritage of our national parks in the past can guide us in making choices for the future. Of course, climate change is a global phenomenon with global causes and effects. So why focus on national parks? Because the parks have been set aside to preserve the very best of our natural and cultural heritages and to be available for the continued enjoyment by future generations. So seeing how we deal with climate change in national parks can teach us a lot about how to deal with it elsewhere. Human disruption of the climate is the greatest threat ever to our national parks. And the parks that we Americans so cherish are already being harmed by climate change. Warmer winters and longer, more intense melt seasons have increased the rate of glacial retreat in Alaska's Glacier Bay and Kenai Fjords National Parks. Scientists estimate that by 2030, many of the glaciers in Montana's Na Glacier National Park will be completely gone. At parks like Bandelier National Monument, higher temperatures and drought have caused their pinion pines to fall victim to bark beetle infestation at higher elevations and in new ranges. At Everglades National Park, increasing sea level may overwhelm mangrove forests that are so vital in maintaining the freshwater wetlands. Higher temperatures in the spring and summer and earlier snowmelt in recent years have fueled an increase in wildfires, especially out west. Many climate change consequences make it hard for park managers to preserve their park's resources unimpaired. And particularly at risk are plant and animal species. Some of those species, the ones with strict habitat restrictions or the ones that can't relocate or are surrounded by human development, have very few options to adapt. And this is leading to losses of wildlife in virtually all national parks around America. For many Americans, the highlight of a trip to a national park is the wildlife they get to see. But a changing climate could mean that their opportunities for sightings are becoming slim. Not only is wildlife becoming less abundant, but some species may even go completely extinct. Just four to five degrees of higher temperatures could leave up to 30% of plant and animal species far outside their current ranges. That would leave these species in great risk of extinction. And even if species don't become extinct altogether, the local populations in our national parks could be wiped out. Some of the risk factors for wildlife include rain shifts, habitat losses, and changes in ecological communities. In Yosemite National Park, a pioneering biologist took inventory of mammals in the park in the early 20th century and these ranges established a baseline for assessing changes in which species live where in the park. Park scientists recently did a resurvey of wildlife which shows that about half of the mammal species are now at different elevations. Most have moved to higher elevations as would be expected in response to rising temperatures. These Yosemite movements are consistent with changes in wildlife ranges around the world. An analysis of 143 species shows that many species worldwide are changing where they live, and more than 80% of those changes are consistent with adaptation to a changed climate, such as moving north 
or higher in elevation to stay ahead of higher temperatures. At Rocky Mountain National Park, the Park Service has expressed concern that the park's bighorn sheep population could decline over time due to the loss of open alpine habitat as forests move upslope. Other parks where forests could encroach on bighorn sheep habitat include Yellowstone, Grand Teton, Glacier, Yosemite, and Sequoia Kings Canyon National Parks. Mountain bighorn sheep aren't the only ones at risk either. Of 80 populations of desert bighorn sheep in California 65 years ago, 30 of them no longer exist. Scientists have determined that the local extinctions occurred most often in the hottest, driest areas. They show that birth and survival rates of desert bighorn lambs go up in wet years and down in dry years. With projections that a changed climate will make the interior west even drier, this raises concerns about the desert bighorn's future across its range, including Joshua Tree and Zion National Parks. Researchers from Yale University studied the possible effects of climate change on mammals in eight national parks. They projected that the doubled atmospheric levels of heat-trapping gases could change habitats in the park enough to eliminate some species. The greatest losses were projected for the southernmost parks in their study, Big Bend and Great Smoky Mountains National Park. They also projected that many new species might move into parks as habitats change. However, one major caveat is that the researchers did not consider whether there would be geographic or other barriers to species moving into parks. Should as many new species move into parks as the researchers projected, there would be substantial new competition for habitat and food, creating another stress on the native local wildlife. There is some evidence in particular parks of how habitat changes could affect park mammals. In Denali National Park and Preserve, and Wrangell St. Elias National Park, frequent winter thaws could lead to ice-crusted snow that is harder for foraging caribou to penetrate to get sufficient food for winter. The caribou also could suffer from changes in park plant communities that diminish their food resources. Moose populations have declined significantly in Isle Royale National Park since the 1980s, and the effects of higher temperatures could be to blame. In Theodore Roosevelt National Park, bison and other native prairie animals may lose habitat and food resources because of invasive plant species that thrive in a hotter climate. In the Yellowstone ecosystem, the fate of the grizzly bear could depend on that of a much smaller creature, the mountain pine beetle, which is infesting and threatening to eliminate high altitude white bark pines and their nuts the most important food source for grizzly bears in this region. The Florida panther, found in Everglades National Park and Big Cypress National Preserve, is one of the most critically endangered mammals in the world, with only about 100 individuals alive in the wild. Like many other species, it could be affected by the likely disruption of South Florida's ecosystems. But an even larger risk to the Florida panther could be its lack of a key advantage for any species. Enough genetic variation in its population to give some individual animals different traits that would help them survive in profoundly different conditions. With such a tiny population and a history of inbreeding, the Florida panther could fall short at the feet of climate change. Another type of risk facing nearly all kinds of wildlife is a disruption of their ecosystems from changed timing of seasons. In the United States, spring now arrives 10 days to two weeks earlier than two decades ago. About 60% of all species worldwide appear to already be responding by changing where they live or the timing of their life cycles. For example, by ending hibernation, migrating, or breeding earlier. A risk is that one species may change in one way, and other species on which they depend may respond in different ways and with different timing, disrupting habitats, food supplies, or other needs of the first species. One animal at risk of these disruptions of timings is the Canada lynx. Boreal forest, snow, and snowshoe hare, the primary food source for the lynx, 
may not shift synchronously. So, climate change could produce habitat fragmentation and, at the least, disruption of the conditions that the Canada lynx require for survival. Glacier National Park and many parks in Alaska are home to the Canada lynx, already a threatened species in the contiguous United States. One team of researchers has documented that most areas where lynx currently occupy depend on continuous months of snow cover and temperatures well below freezing. But just a four to seven degree increase in annual temperatures could reduce the overlap between these cold, snowy conditions and the types of forests where cats live, which could eliminate about half of the lynx's suitable habitat in the contiguous United States and about 10% of its habitat across all of North America. And it's not only the charismatic and popular mammals of our parks that are in danger. All walks of life are under threat to a changing climate, from birds, reptiles, and amphibians, to fish and coral reefs. To American bird watchers, one of the most accessible and famous populations of white-tailed ptarmigan is on the tundra of Rocky Mountain National Park along Trail Ridge Road. Between 1975 and 1999, however, their populations have been cut in half due to increases in April and May temperatures, which correspond to earlier hatching of ptarmigan chicks. If the same relationship between ptarmigan numbers and increasing temperatures persists, researchers have suggested the birds could become locally extinct in the park in another 10 to 20 years as temperatures continue rising. Sea level rise could pose problems for some bird populations as well. In Everglades National Park, rising seas and stronger coastal storms could destroy habitat for the endangered Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow, Roseate Spoonbills, Wood Storks, Snail Kites, and other species not found in many other places in the country. With a three-foot rise in sea levels, much of Padre Island National Seashore would be flooded eliminating habitat for migrating and overwintering shorebirds and waterfowl. With the same sea level rise, Dry Tortugas National Park could be completely submerged, eliminating a key resting stop for migrating birds in the Gulf of Mexico and the only significant breeding colony in the United States of sooty terns. Also in Dry Tortugas National Park, a study of nesting endangered loggerhead and green sea turtles from 1995 through 2006, showed that in years of strong coastal storms, the hatching success of both species declines, as high storm-driven waves flood or expose turtle nests and beaches. These turtle species have always lost nests to coastal storms, but previously, larger populations and more widely spread nesting areas helped sustain them. Now, Nesting sites have been lost to human developments, and population levels have dropped to 10% or less of those before European settlement. As a result, the turtle's margin of safety appears dangerously small in the face of any further stresses, such as the projected increase in coastal storm strength. In Everglades National Park, alligators, crocodiles, sea turtles, and mangrove terrapins have an unusual vulnerability to hotter temperatures. The gender of offspring is determined by temperatures during embryo incubation, so unnaturally high temperatures could disrupt the gender balance of new generations. Worldwide, amphibians appear to be the first large-scale wildlife victims of a hotter climate, in part because Higher temperatures promote the spread of a fungus that kills amphibians. In Yosemite and Sequoia Kings Canyon National Parks, researchers have discovered a recent 10% decline per year in the population of mountain yellow-legged frogs in park lakes and streams. Most remaining frogs are infected with the same fungal disease, becoming more widespread elsewhere. Researchers also link the decline to shrinking snowpacks that dry up ponds and make the frogs more vulnerable to the trout that prey on them. The vulnerability of these frogs to hotter, drier conditions illustrates how a changed climate is causing amphibian declines in ways other than promoting the spread of the same fungus. As another example, at Bandelier National Monument, 
a decline in the Hemis Mountains salamanders is thought to be a result of hotter, drier conditions. Below the surface, water temperatures are also rising in response to climate change, which is having a profound effect on fish and coral reef communities. An altered climate is likely to reduce inland populations of cold water fish species, including trout and salmon. For trout in the interior west, a hotter climate is the single greatest threat to their survival. When water temperatures reach the mid 70s, trout can die. In Yellowstone National Park's Firehole River in 2007, temperatures topped 80 degrees Fahrenheit for several days, and as many as a thousand trout died in the largest documented fish kill in the park's 135 year history. Under a high emissions future, Rocky Mountain streams could warm up enough to reduce trout habitat by 50% or more by the end of the century. Affected parks could include Glacier, Grand Teton, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Rocky Mountain, Yellowstone, and Yosemite National Parks. About 90% of bull trout, which live in western rivers in some of the country's wildest places, are projected to be lost due to warming. In the southern Appalachian Mountains, which includes Great Smoky Mountains National Park, over half of wild trout populations could disappear because of hotter streams, and trout populations in Acadia and Shenandoah National Parks could also be affected. Salmon, too, are vulnerable to higher water temperatures, as well as to changes in stream flows and heat-driven increases in diseases and parasites. Studies suggest that perhaps 40% of Northwest salmon populations could be lost by 2050. By 2040, in Olympic National Park, water in streams with Chinook and Coho salmon could reach about 68 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer, high enough to be stressful for fish. On the Skagit River, which flows through the North Cascades National Park, by 2080, temperatures could reach 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Marine fish populations may also suffer from an altered climate, in part because of the destructive impacts on coral reefs. Corals, which are marine animals, and the astonishingly rich ecosystems of the reefs they build, are represented in our national parks more than many people realize. Parks containing coral reefs are American Samoa, Biscayne, Dry Tortugas, Haleakala, and Hawaii Volcanoes National Parks. Coral reefs are among the ecosystems most affected by human emissions. The primary reef building corals in Atlantic waters, elkhorn and staghorn corals, have already declined by more than 97% since the 1970s along the Florida Keys, in Dry Tortugas National Park, and in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Disease, heat-driven bleaching, and damage from hurricanes are the principal culprits. As a result, they were given federal protection under the Endangered Species Act in 2006. Coral bleaching is a particular threat clearly linked to hotter temperatures. The often brilliant colors of corals actually come from algae that the corals host. When stressed enough though, corals eject the algae and lose their color. Since the 1980s, this coral bleaching has greatly increased. On a small scale, bleaching can be caused by a variety of factors, but large-scale mass bleaching has been conclusively linked to a single cause, unusually high water temperatures. The most extensive episodes of coral bleaching have all occurred during the hottest years on record. A well-studied example was in the waters of Virgin Islands National Park in 2005 where researchers documented the loss of half of the park's corals from high water temperatures. Other parks have experienced losses of coral reefs too. During the late 1990s, Biscayne National Park, like much of the Florida Keys, lost approximately 40% of its corals. When corals die, not just the coral reef ecosystem, but also the larger marine environment are affected. As one example, reefs, are important feeding grounds for wide-ranging marine fish species. In the Caribbean, 
the loss of coral reefs has been associated with an overall decline in fish populations since the mid-1990s. The 1916 Organic Act, which founded the National Park Service, defined its mission as follows. To conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein, and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in such manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. This strong mandate of preservation, sustainability, and non-degradation is embodied by the National Park Service's policies and its long, proud tradition of environmental stewardship. The National Park Service's management policies boldly declares that the service will use all available authorities to protect park resources and values from potentially harmful activities. Sadly, National Park's resource managers have been slow to address climate change, due in part to lack of specific guidance for incorporating climate change into their management actions and planning efforts. Without such guidance about whether or how to address climate change, managers find themselves uncertain about what actions, if any, they should take. Two actions in particular can be profoundly beneficial in preserving suitable habitat for maintaining wildlife populations in our national parks. One way of protecting wildlife would be opening new and expanded parks. For several reasons, the current boundaries of many national parks are not adequate to allow for the preservation of the resources and values that are the purposes of the parks. One key reason is that most park boundaries were established in the 19th and 20th centuries, long before any consideration was given to how human-caused climate change could affect park resources. Also, the 391 parks now in the system don't adequately include a fully representative sample of America's best natural resources. Therefore, Congress, the administration, and the National Park Service should comprehensively assess the need for new national parks and designate new parks to preserve the best examples of America's natural resources for future generations. The same assessments should be made of the adequacy of existing park boundaries to determine where a changed climate may alter conditions and ecosystems so much so that current park boundaries would no longer be enough to ensure the preservation of the park's resources that were the purpose of the park's designation in the first place. The new and expanded parks should be large enough to allow for adaptation and migration by species for their continued survival. However, areas within park borders may not be enough to provide the room and flexibility for wildlife and plants to adapt to changes in park ecosystems. Therefore, actions on a broad geographic scale will be needed to provide that room and flexibility. So where new and expanded parks won't be adequate enough, the Park Service should promote and cooperate with preserving areas outside of park boundaries. This would include cooperation with other land management agencies and landowners to preserve large enough ecosystems, crucial habitat, and migration corridors so that plants and animals have opportunities to move and continue to survive in these changing landscapes.